When we talk about biology, we tend to picture sparkling white labs and the incredible precision with which we can now manipulate the natural world. But it wasn't always like that. Frankly, what we think of as modern biology has barely been around for more than 150 years. Sure, we knew which plants were good for treating ailments and could maybe set a bone, but at the time we thought that the body was based on humors or four types of fluid that dictated emotion and disease. We thought insects just spontaneously generated from nothing when food was bad. Suffice it to say, we call it the Dark Ages for a reason. It wasn't until the invention of the microscope that things really started to actually get going, but what you probably didn't know was that it couldn't have gotten started without what seems like an innocuous enough plant. You see, the problem with a microscope is that while it lets you see the microscopic detail of life, life is mostly a transparent white when you look at it close enough. So past a point, you can't actually make out the difference between one bit of a cell and another. What you need is a way to make certain parts one color and different parts a different color. What they needed was the first histological stains. Enter this weird looking thing. It's not actually a plant, even though it's often confused for one. It's actually a lichen, which are one of the weirder types of life. Lichen are actually a superorganism composed of at least one species of fungi and one species of algae, or other photosynthetic microbe. Based on which two you find together dictates what species it is, and as such, you usually find the same ones together. Many species like this one aren't rare and can be found on basically anything that's been left alone long enough. They're able to grow on any hard surface, though are usually found on trees. Some, like the rock-eating species, can grow on the rock surface and slowly dissolve rocks to absorb their nutrients. Many species are very slow growers and can live up to 10,000 years. The species we're interested in is called Rochella tinctoria, though some others can be used as a stand-in. Back in the early 1300s, people figured out that you can extract a compound called orsinol, which can be converted to a red dye through a process that was eventually patented in 1813. Though, of course, at the time they didn't know what the dye was, they just knew how to make it. All you had to do was treat an aqueous lichen extract with ammonia, usually in the form of urine, and air to form the dye. The dye is now known as orsian, but used to be called arkel. If you've ever been in a chemistry lab, then you're probably very familiar with the products of this lichen, even if you don't know it. During the conversion process, if you add potash, lime, and gypsum to the reaction, instead of orsian, you get litmus. Early chemists quickly realized that it was a great broad-range pH indicator, and so it helped pave the way for innovation in chemistry as well. But back to orsian. What makes it special is that it can dye a variety of cellular structures and was one of the earliest histological stains. With orsian in hand, early biologists were able to learn an immense amount about the workings of the cell. But to really understand why, we're going to need to put the dye to work to see what it can do. I'm going to be preparing a root tip squash so that we can look at some cells after we dye them. The procedure varies, but always requires three things. Some tissue to stain, the dye, and a fixative. The best fixative for plants is Carnoy's solution, which is a mixture of ethanol and glacial acetic acid in a 9 to 1 ratio. Let the tissue sit in the fixative for a couple of minutes, and this will help hold all of the structures in place after we dye them. After the tissue has been fixed, cut 2 millimeters off the end of one of the roots, and then add the dye and let it sit for 3 minutes. Drain away any excess stain, and then place a cover slip on top. To actually make the squash, use a pencil or other small item and drop it directly down onto the cover slip above where the root tip is, from an inch or two in the air. Repeating this a couple of times will spread out the cells enough that we can see individual cells without them being on top of each other. But be careful not to move or break the cover slip. Only strike straight down or you'll smear the cells and see nothing. If all goes well, the first thing you'll notice when you look around is that at the center of every cell is a round section. As you probably know, this is the nucleus of the cell. Here's a comparison of a stained and unstained root. Notice how much harder the nucleus is to see without the stain? This is how the nucleus was first discovered. Once stained, it makes it impossible to miss. Now, picture you're in the late 1800s. The nucleus has just been discovered, so you start to wonder where they come from. How do cells make a new one? Does it just bud off? The hypothesis at the time was that a new one just forms from the liquid inside the cells. As you're making slide after slide, you eventually notice something. In a few of the cells, the nucleus is missing, and new structures are present. I'll be honest, this might take you a few tries to find, since if the roots aren't actively growing, you won't be able to find any examples of this, as I found out the hard way. The best way to see this is to place an onion or clove of garlic in water for 10 days and use the newest growing roots. I'd love to show you a slide I made, but I used non-growing roots for the first few attempts, and after waiting the 10 days, when I went to collect my onion from the plant room, somebody had thrown it out by accident. So here's a picture of what to expect instead. When you do find some non-nucleus centers, you'll start to notice that they come in a few distinct arrangements. You'll probably recognize these as the steps of mitosis, but to the first biologist, these were new and exciting features. Not long after this find, the discovery of the chromosome was announced. Combining the work of Gregor Mendel and others, people began to suspect that the chromosomes were where the instructions for life must be hiding, but they had no idea how that worked. 
To really start to understand these weird new structures, we're going to need to find them in a different organism. Enter the common fruit fly, scientist's favorite lab rat. Y you know, other than lab rats, of course. Fruit flies at face value may not seem interesting, but at a particular time in their life cycle, some very specific cells in their body do something really weird. Originally, I had intended on catching some fruit flies and waiting for them to make maggots, but I was running late, so my friend Jesse from Cybus Adventures helped me dig through our compost pile to find some. After half an hour of us digging through garbage and almost vomiting when a really nasty piece got unearthed, we managed to find a few, which should have been enough for the experiment. But I ended up messing up, and the dissection was completely ruined, so I used all of these before I got a good sample. I was lucky enough to find more in one of our kombucha scobies later, so I didn't need to go through compost again. If you're going to try this, you'll probably mess it up the first few times, as dissecting something so small is very difficult, and the organ we need is almost invisible. So having lots of maggots to work with will make your life far easier. When I first did this experiment in university, it was common that in a lab of 40 or 50 people, only 1 to 3 actually managed to make a good sample, so try not to get too frustrated with it. Also, if you're going to try this, use a proper dissection scope. I used a regular microscope, and there was way too much zoom, which made this even harder. Luckily, I've already done this procedure before, so I was able to deal with it, but if you're going to try this, make your life easy, get a dissection scope. Okay, dissection time. Fair warning, this is going to be gross, and we're going to need to sacrifice some maggots. If this makes you uncomfortable, jump to the time on screen to see the result. The dissection itself is actually pretty straightforward, and only requires a pair of forceps and a probe or mounted needle. We want the salivary glands, which are almost invisible, but there are fat bodies attached, which make them much easier to find. Transfer a maggot to a clean slide and find it in your scope. First, we need to pin its mouth parts down. They're constantly moving, so I find the trick to this is to wait for them to extend and then pin them down to the slide with the probe. Then grab the back side of the maggot with the forceps about three quarters of the way down and gently pull. If done properly, all the tissues should just come right out, but this doesn't always go according to plan, or cleanly, so sometimes you'll need to start again if it's a mess. Also, don't wet the slide until after the initial pull, which is contrary to what you'll find in the instructions if you ever look this procedure up. When they're wet, the maggots are almost impossible to get a decent grip on. Once the organs are exposed, then add a little bit of water to keep them from drying out or getting damaged. Try and remember to keep track of what you're looking at so you don't get confused about which white blob you want, because they all look the same. If you do get lost, consult an anatomy chart and you should be able to figure out what everything is. Here are the salivary glands you want, and you can see just how difficult they are to see. But the fat bodies they're connected to are very, very easy to find, so use those as a landmark. Use the probe to gently clean away any of the tissues you don't want, but leave the salivary glands attached to the mouth parts. This will make it much easier to handle without damaging them. If all goes well, you'll end up with some clean salivary glands, and we can move on to staining. When I add a little bit of stain, you can see the glands much more easily. Let them stain for two minutes, and then we can prepare the squash like before. This time, though, instead of dropping something onto the slide, place the cover slip on top like before, then a folded Kim wipe or paper towel on top of that. Then use your thumb to press straight down hard onto the slide. This should burst the cells and expose the chromosomes. It can be very disappointing if after all that work you don't get a good slide, so it's helpful to dissect several maggots before you're attempting to make the squash, so you've got a better chance of finding a good sample. But if done well, this is the result. This is called a polyteen chromosome. Normally, chromosomes make a single copy, and then during mitosis, the pair is pulled apart. But in a polyteen chromosome, the cells make thousands of copies, and they all stay bundled together. You also probably notice this distinct banding pattern. Ever wonder why chromosomes are drawn with bands? It's because of this. The difference in color is because different areas of DNA are either tightly coiled and not in use, making a darker band, or expanded and actively being used to produce proteins, making a lighter band. And we know that because of this experiment and its countless variations. By looking at the banding pattern between flies and between fly generations, it's even possible to literally see the bands change location and follow inheritance patterns. In combination with the work done by Gregor Mendel, we learned that chromosomes are the place where genetic information is stored. And all of this discovery was thanks to a simple species of lichen. Of course, with the advent of other dyes, we learned even more about how cells work. Nowadays, we tend to use things like immunofluorescent labeling, because they're even more specific rather than histological stains. But stains are still in active use in labs around the world. One stain that's still in use, and is one of my favorites, is called Taludian Blue. It's used extensively in plant biology to learn about the workings of plants, and we'll explore that in a future episode. It's also a much less toxic compound than orcean, and can be used in place in this experiment to visualize DNA, though we'll be using it for a different purpose. And with that, I'll wrap up this video. 
If you enjoyed this sort of historical experimentation, let me know in the comments, as there's lots of other interesting ones which really help shine light on the scientific process and how we came to be where we are today. If you like the video and want to see more, be sure to subscribe, and most importantly, click the bell icon so you know when I post new videos, or the YouTube AI won't serve them to you. If you've got suggestions for other experiments, be sure to leave them in the comments. As always, a big thanks to my patrons who help make these videos possible. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time.